But I want to begin by talking about a criminal case that I read about um, over the uh, Easter long weekend and involved a charge of indecent assault. Um, indecent assault by a police officer. Now what the police officer did was he was posing for a photo at some charity event and he had a female in front of him. Now I don't know whether he whispered but he said in the um, female's ear, I hope you take this the right way. And he pinched her bottom. His excuse was, well I thought it would have made for a funny photo. Um, the female standing in front was uh, shocked and humiliated by what occurred. Um, as I said, the police officer was charged with indecent ins uh, assault and was acquitted of indecent assault. And the judge, Magistrate Michelle Ridley, said, in the era of twerking, grinding, and easy access to pornography. Something like pinching someone on the bottom seems to have lost its overtly sexual connotation. I thought, what the? <laughs> um, and I think looking at the Twitter feed, there were a couple, couple of WTFs. But Amber, surely such conduct would be inappropriate in the workplace? Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, and can I get you to skip to the next slide for a moment? Because I want to show everybody this. Um, you will all be familiar with it. But I'm wondering whether it is time to rethink how we deal with the issue of sexual harassment in the workplace and whether we need to be making the concept less complicated and just turning our minds to the question of inappropriate workplace conduct. Why do I say that? Um, what we know is that the prohibition against sexual harassment was introduced into the Sex Discrimination Act about 25 years ago. Okay. Um, what we also know is that current rates of sexual harassment in the workplace are around one in four, one in five women and one in ten men. The problem is not going away and it's not being fixed. Um, so let's look at the definition just for one moment. Okay, here we go. A person sexually harasses another person if the person makes an unwelcome sexual advance or an unwelcome request for sexual favours, what's a sexual favour, um, engages in other unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature in relation to the person harassed in circumstances in which a reasonable person, having regard to all the circumstances, would have anticipated the possibility um, that the person harassed would be offended, humiliated or intimidated. Are we just overcomplicating matters? The example that you've given, James, is a perfect example. It was inappropriate conduct. It doesn't matter whether it was um, had a sexual connotation. It was a man who thought it was appropriate in the workplace to pinch a woman's bum. Not appropriate. Um, of course, there's legal liability attached oh, there is. To, to this definition. Um, your comments certainly make sense from the perspective of HR yes. managing behaviour um, and, and whether or not, and, and I wonder if this is something whether you have a view on, whether or not you need to um, get into a, the debate about whether or not particular conduct was sexual harassment or not, whether it was a sexual failure, whether it was um, reasonable or not, and just say it's not on. Agreed. So, to so that's the extent, approach you're advocating. He's setting me up here, okay. everybody. He's setting me up. You ready? I am. I am. Well, well, I am setting you up because um, if if I brush someone in the corridor, a female in the corridor, or or, or a male, um, inadvertent conduct or contact like that wouldn't be sexual harassment. No. And I'm I'm allowed to ask someone if they want to go out on a date once. Absolutely. And, you know, my, my father never gave up. He, he asked a few times and we, we, without him asking a few times, I wouldn't be here the today. Would be an place to well, or, or, or a better place. So how far does the, the, the definition of sexual harassment go or not go? Good question. Show us a picture. Well, 
It's a grey area, Amber, but... <laughs> talk about Barnaby. Um, and, and let's uh, deal with the issue of... It's not popping up, but... Um, do we go to the lengths of implementing a bonk ban? Should we do a quick uh, raise of hands? Hand up if you are in favour of the bonk ban. Ooh. I think I win, James. No. Nor am I. Well, <laughs> well um, certainly I've been on the uh, receiving end on, on behalf of a client. Um, <laughs> where a mutual relationship has gone south in the workplace and all of a sudden there are questions about power imbalance and alleging that the, that the conduct that occurred in the past that everyone thought was consensual was unwelcomed and you're dealing with a complaint of sexual harassment. Um, you don't pay your workers to put yourself in the position where you've got to deal with these matters. What's wrong with having a bonk ban and James, what about expecting <laughs> well, what about your mum and dad what, what about all the wonderful people I could employ instead of paying a, 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 a lot of money to deal with a frivolous complaint James and I have had quite heated discussions about this particular issue you may have noticed um, my view is that a bonk ban is going too far um, we hope and expect that for the most part people will conduct themselves as adults in the workplace. Obviously that doesn't always happen. But in terms of what the issue is for the workplace at a base level, um, what we're dealing with is the notion of conflict of interest. Are people engaging in a relationship which has the ability to influence decisions or have the perception that people have been given uh, favouritism or bias exercise in their favour? So my view on managing the situation is conflict of interest policies need to be more express around what um, employee obligations are, around managers conducting uh, pay review discussions with people in which they're having a relationship and so on. And the real question is around disclosure and I believe that's where our friend Barnaby got himself into the most trouble was that he didn't disclose and he made decisions which, even if they were made without actual bias, had the perception of bias. I'm on a board of a very big company and the CEO discloses that they're having a relationship or they're thinking about starting a relationship with someone that reports to them. Um, and I ask you whether or not we should have the CEO and the other person that's in the relationship sign a love contract that 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 affirms that it's consensual that there there will be no action taken against the company in the event that it all goes south um, and I come to you with that idea what, I what say do you is say this, I don't love it as a human but I understand it from a risk management perspective um, so then let me ask you this question is the Me Too movement good for business and not our business? Is it good for the business <laughs> of business? business. <laughs> um, look, my view is that it is. Um, uh, I'm not a fan of Harvey Weinstein, don't get me wrong, but I actually think that the Me Too movement is creating a fantastic momentum that we need to cause the change that legislation is not affecting. Um, as I said, we have the legislation in place and the rates are not improving. Um, all of a sudden, we have this groundswell and also people um, at a mass level feeling comfortable to say, me too. Look at the stats for a moment. So look around the room. Um, apparently one in five women. So what that means is sitting in this room are a whole bunch of women who have been sexually harassed in the workplace. Similarly, one in 10 men. Again, we have more, ten, more than 10 men in the room. Um, these stats are horrific, and it's something that law itself is clearly not addressing. We need a social movement. Um, 
certainly the statistics on the Me Too um, movement is, 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 is quite alarming in the sense that it went viral just in October last year. 4.7 million times the hashtag was used in the first 24 hours, which is astounding, and it's still being referred to today. Um, a real issue, however, for business is the fact that, um, and, and, and I suppose equally a real issue for, for, for victims and alleged perpetrators is the media storm that flows in respect of these issues today. And we've just got to think about the city of Melbourne, who is probably one of the most recent uh, entities to go through such a process and, 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 and a public scandal where the Lord Mayor, um, Robert Doyle, was accused of sexual harassment. These are some of the um, media uh, headlines that came out at the time and then followed at the conclusion of the investigation. But I, I ask you this question, Amber, should fear of the media and the public response that flows with these allegations dictate employer responses? I don't think fear of the media should dictate responses. I think um, a desire to be um, an employer of choice should dictate responses. And I can add to this example, um, in the legal fraternity last week or the week before, there was a scandal in inverted commas where a very senior partner of Herbert Smith Freehill, so arguably one of the biggest um, uh, law firms in Australia, actually removed one of the senior equity partners amid allegations of sexual harassment. And the gentleman who was removed was named and chained in the media. There was a photograph of him accompanying the story and it was very big news. It was very big news because it was in a law firm, um, because it was a senior partner who was generating an awful lot of money for that organisation. Um, but the thing that I found interesting was the media statement that uh, Herbert Smith Freehills made about the allegations. Um, and that was along the lines of, um, for the women who had courage to come to us and bring this to our attention, we had to act swiftly um, and we had to put a stop to this conduct. And all of a sudden, using the word of courage in that context, was sending a message to that particular workplace that this organisation, <coughs> excuse me, had a real commitment to wanting to be an employer of choice. And I think, um, and I'm sure um, it wasn't necessarily deliberate, but the way it did play out in the media, um, I think will have elevated the perception of that particular brand in many consumers' minds. Mm. So I think that's a really important issue for employers to bear in mind as well. Do you think the way these allegations tend to play out in the media may discourage people coming forward for fear of it being in the public eye? Look, absolutely. And we had, um, again, if we look at the context of the Barnaby Joyce incident, so we had somebody who did um, raise an issue but did it on the basis of anonymity and then had that um, agreement effectively breached. And this is a real problem. And it, it's a real problem about the way that sexual harassment is dealt with is that the onus effectively shifts to um, the employee, or sorry, the, the victim, to be the person who puts up their hand and is the champion of their own cause. And that's a really difficult position to put somebody in. Um, and I think it plays into the issue of how do we investigate complaints as well. And before I jump there, um, the alleged perpetrator and their Absolutely. reputation and their standing within the business, within the community, be bearing in mind that their allegations, um, and the allegations might not reach the standard of uh, sexual harassment, there, there, there might be a whole lot of things that mean they didn't engage in that behaviour or it was behaviour of a different nature, maybe inappropriate, maybe unwise. Um, media is also affecting the reputation of the alleged perpetrators. And that's something that an employer needs to manage. How, how do Absolutely. they go about doing that? Absolutely. Um, and we can see that again. A, a very recent example has been in the context of Craig McLaughlin. So allegations were made against him. Um, he has publicly denied those allegations. 
and he has now taken the next step of pursuing defamation proceedings on the basis that he says that the allegations are simply not true and they're impacting on his reputation. Um, so it's a really tricky balancing act. Um, mud is thrown and we know that sometimes mud can stick and so there is this perennial issue for employers when you're managing these types of matters of, on the one hand, um, wanting to support somebody who appears to have come forward in good faith, had the courage to raise the issue, but on the other hand, ensuring that the person who is the accused is afforded procedural fairness. So how do we balance those objectives? And I suppose confidentiality is an important part of that. Um, gag orders in the, in the sense of telling your staff, look, you can make a complaint to us, but don't go to the media, let us deal with it. That's a real tricky area, isn't it? Look, absolutely. And I think um, uh, Seven has taught us mm. that gag orders are not necessarily an effective legal tool mm. in any event. That's right. And if I can just jump in, James, I think also uh, with the rise of the Me Too movement and more people coming forward, traditional strategies that employers might have used um, are becoming much riskier mm. solutions. So I think Craig <coughs> McLaughlin's very vigorous defence of his claim is one thing. To then bring a defamation action and really a character assassination of the complainant, um, in the current climate I think it doesn't play out very well and I think employers would be wise to keep that in mind, that it is this very tricky balancing act but at what point does going on the offensive and attacking the complainant mm. really perhaps just reinforce the issues that that person's complaining about in the first place? Mm. And and that trickiness, I, I must say, worries me when you get matters where it's low-level um, conduct, probably inappropriate but, but low-level, and you've got a continuing employment relationship that you need to manage. And if you've got staff going off publicly alleging their allegations, other staff threatening or taking defamation proceedings, the employer's left in a position of, is it almost unmanageable? Well, I think, I think the answer to that is um, that a good process that your employees have confidence in can deal with a lot of that uncertainty because why, why are people going to the press or why, why do people feel they need to start an action separately? Often it's because they don't have any confidence in the process that's going to be followed. Mm -hmm. So I think we've dealt with that. Um, what I wanted to talk about is the the City of Melbourne um, did an investigation and they released a censored report um, in relation to the investigation into uh, uh, Robert Doyle and this is how the, the SBS reported it by saying the investigation used what is known as the Brigginshaw standard which requires them to be reasonably satisfied of specific allegations. It's a lower standard of proof than the criminal standard which is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And it almost suggests that the investigation used a third standard of proof to find whether or not the allegations were substantiated and was comfortable when there were witnesses to the events, but when it was one-on-one, -on -one, found the allegations unsubstantiated. Now that raises a real difficult issue because I think in, in, in one sense, adopting that approach, Amber, are you not giving any veracity to the complaint of the victim as well as do you need to adopt that approach to protect reputations or the possibility that someone is innocent? Yeah, look, I think, um, and picking up on your point, mm. Susan, I think it's time to rethink the way we deal with sexual harassment um, allegations <coughs> and investigations. Um, historically, it has been the case that um, the uh, risk minimisation strategy has been let's do an independent investigation, let's uh, interview all of these people, let's go through this process of a weighing exercise and seeing whether we are more satisfied than not that it did happen, but informed by the principles in Brigginshaw, um, which means that, oh, we've got to think about it even more carefully and golly gosh, look at the consequences that it may have for him, and I'll say him because it generally is, or can I really be satisfied? And it's, it's, it's a tricky exercise. Um, so I would like to share a real life example, um, which does include some poetic 
um, license and flourishes, but not where you expect in this story. Um, and this is just an example of um, working constructively with an employer client about, okay, let's step through the scenarios and what is going to be the best way to get to an outcome in this particular matter, rather than really outsourcing the problem to an independent investigator. So this is the scenario. It's Friday night drinks. That's not the problem in and of itself. Um, there is a manager that is having a casual drink with somebody in the team um, named Betty. And the manager is talking about this fantastic employee in the workplace called Bob. Isn't Bob wonderful? Isn't Bob a great guy? And, and Betty, who's had a couple of drinks, uh, pipes up and says, oh, no, I actually don't think Bob's such a great guy. And the manager says, oh, why don't you think Bob's such a great guy? And she says, oh, back in 2016, um, Bob bailed me up in the storeroom, closed the door, um, and flashed out his penis at me. And the manager said, what? What are you talking about? And she said, yeah, and then he proceeded um, over the next few weeks to send me dick pics. And the manager said, oh my God, um, this, is, this is terrible. When did this happen? She says, 2016. He says, why didn't you make a complaint about it? And she said, oh, you know, have another drink. I don't want to talk about it. He says, no, I can't say that. Um, you know, you've brought this to my attention. I need to do something about this. This is terrible. And she says, look, we're just having a drink as friends. Don't you dare mention this to anybody. You know, this is, I'm not making a complaint. I don't want this to go further. So what does the manager do? The manager sleeps over, it, over the weekend and on the Monday morning approaches HR. That's the first sensible move. Um, but then here's the conversation. So the manager says, look, this apparently happened back in 2016. She doesn't want to do anything about it. She doesn't want to make a complaint. She's not going to help us with an investigation. What do we do? Do we need to do anything? It happened back in 2016. So what's the first response to that? Um, yes, it doesn't matter that it happened back in 2016. Um, what if it's happening with somebody else? Then the next issue is, well, golly, how do we manage the fact that this apparently happened in a storeroom with the door closed and she is not going to help us with our investigation? So we have a he said, she said. So what do we do next? All right, we start thinking about, well, what other evidence might there be? How can we, what, you know? So, we, so our mind immediately turns to, what evidence can we collect? But then, of course, as is always the case, there was a sense of urgency in this particular instance because somebody was going on a conference, so we needed to make sure that things were dealt with quickly. And we thought, well, what do we know about an investigation? If we go down the path of an investigation, it's going to be slow, um, and inevitably, we'll probably end up with a he said, she said. So does this actually advance our resolution of whether or not this happened or not? Um, and we said, why don't we just get him in for a chat? Why don't we, why don't we just have a discussion with him? Um, and we sort of thought through the scenarios. How might he respond? Okay, so first of all, we thought, let's just deal with this as an issue of inappropriate workplace conduct. Let's not introduce the concept of sexual harassment. Let's not think about whether it was welcome or not. If you're at work and somebody flops it out, that is not appropriate. I don't care whether that was invited or not. Um, so let's deal with it as workplace, inappropriate workplace conduct. And let's just put it to him. Let's say, look, we haven't done an investigation. We've heard a rumor, we're concerned about it. Before we do anything about it, you know, wanted to pay you the courtesy of actually raising this with you. And we thought, look, how might he respond? Number one, he might, you know, vehemently deny it, be indignant, this is outrageous, this is disgusting, you know. Um, and then we'd have to work out, all right, what do we do next in the face of that response? Or he might say, oh, no, I don't recall. And then we all agreed that would be pretty implausible. I need a lawyer and say that. Or he might try and justify the conduct by saying, oh yeah, it did happen, but she wanted it. It was welcome. So we thought, let's have a conversation and see how it plays out. So the conversation is had, and his immediate response is, I don't recall, but I have to tell you, there was somebody in the workplace that, you know, I wouldn't call it a relationship, but we did, you know. So his immediate response was effectively, she wanted it. So I did it because it was welcome. Now, what do we know 
about the definition of sexual harassment. It's got all these layers. Was it sexual conduct? Was it welcome? What would the reasonable person think? Well, what if they were in a relationship? What does that mean? Golly, what do we do with this information? We were able to ignore that because we weren't worried about whether it was sexual harassment or not. We were talking about whether it was inappropriate conduct. So basically, in this meeting, we said to him, well, look, we're going to have to think about what to do next. Um, thanks for speaking to us, uh, but, you know, we're, we're probably going to need to investigate this. And so the next day we get a letter, a letter which is this indignant, I deny, this never happened, um, I'm offended that anybody would accuse me of this, which was actually quite different from what he'd said in the course of the meeting. And then that was shortly followed by his resignation. Um, and so uh, he left and clearly he knew that what he would, had done was not appropriate workplace conduct. And what had that employer achieved in that scenario? It had achieved an outcome in two days. Um, now, look, the conversation may have played out differently. There may have um, been a, a, a different path that we had to follow depending on what his response was. But I think it does just feed into Susan's point is, we need to rethink how we're dealing with these issues. Thank you. Now we're going to move on, but I'll just say this real quickly. Um, we were going to make the point that mitigating circumstances, um, whilst they're, they're certainly relevant in the context of an unfair dismissal and, and they tend to, to come into play, less so are the excuses of I was drunk, it was, you know, had a lot of red wine, or hey, I'm Italian, I hug and kiss, get over it, is not going to wash as much these days. 